Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the development sessions. I'm Stephanie Russell, and I'm the Economic Development Manager for Georgia Municipal Association. And this is a series that's brought to you by GMA as well as Georgia Cities Foundation. And I uh, just wanted to say welcome this morning. Uh, if you uh, are attending and you have a question during the presentation, please feel free to put it in our Q&A section and we will hopefully get to you and be able to answer that for you. Um, I, at this time, I'd like to turn the time over to Mayor Matt from the great city of Osella. He will be our host today. Thanks, Stephanie, and welcome to everybody that's uh, that's on the webinar and, and everyone who's watching after the fact. Welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us for this. Um, the title of today's conversation is Placemaking in Public Spaces. And with all that's going on with uh, something called a global pandemic, uh, that, that may be easy to say, oh, we can't talk about that now because gathering in public spaces, um, not, not exactly something we're supposed to be doing uh, it, under these circumstances. But I hope everyone's still having the conversations and making the plans because as soon as vaccines are disseminated, we should all get together and have big parties in, in, uh, in our public spaces. So we're gonna have some conversations with three very qualified people to, uh, to talk to us about this. Uh, we're going to have panel discussions that each of them are going to make a presentation and at the end we'll have some Q&A with all them. So let me introduce them at this time. Our first presenter is going to be Mr. Adam Williamson. Adam waved everybody, although I'm sure they know that which one's Adam. <laughs> Adam is a planner and landscape architect and he's a principal with TSW where he specializes in the planning and design of livable communities and sustainable developments. He has experience in directing projects in both the public and the private sector and has broad experience with facilitating the public involvement process. Very important. We'll be talking about that. His focus on implementation of projects ranges from catalytic projects to complete street design and park design. He's designed projects in many states and also has some international experience in places like Costa Rica, India, China, and Nicaragua. Our next presenter today is Ms. April Norton. She's currently the Director of Economic and Community Development at the City of Thomasville. April, wave for everybody. Uh, before that, she served as the Director of Main Street and Business Development also for the City of Thomasville. In 2010, she originally joined Thomasville as the Marketing Associate and accepted a position in 2015 as the Director of Thomasville's Main Street Program and Downtown Development Authority. So uh, April, it seems like uh, the, the time is right for you to get some new responsibilities in the next year or two. It sounds like you just, you, you just move up into uh, responsibilities in Thomasville and have some great things going on there. Uh, our third presenter is Ms. Courtney Harcourt. Courtney waved everybody. She's the Main Street Manager for the City of Noonan. She currently serves as the Staff Liaison for the Noonan Downtown Development Authority. She's been with the City of Noonan since 2013, and she holds a Master's Degree of Heritage Preservation in Historic Preservation from Georgia State University and a BA in History from Georgia Southern University. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and start with the presentations in the, in the order that I introduced everybody. Uh, at the end, like I said, we're gonna have a, a time for q and I've got some questions, but would very much like to uh, ask our panelists your questions. So there is a Q&A box that you can find uh, in, in Ring Central here. And you do not have to wait until the end. If something that Adam says in his presentation sparks a question from you, go ahead and put that question in the, in the box and we'll be asking those at the end. Uh, we'd rather talk about what you guys wanna, wanna talk about and make sure you get in the information and some good takeaways from this. Uh, but it's gonna be a great conversation today. And Adam, I'll turn the floor and the screen share over to you to begin. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Adam Williamson with TSW. We're um, grateful to be here today and talk about placemaking in public spaces. And we're going to talk about a few projects that we worked over, worked on over the years: um, downtown Woodstock, Parsons Alley in Duluth, Georgia, Powder Springs, and then a recent one that we're actually kind of working on now is a, a Midtown Streetscapes. And today we're going to really focus more on the physical attributes of how to make great places and placemaking. Um, there's a lot more involved. I think um, Courtney and, and others, April, will maybe talk more about the community involvement and some of these other aspects. But this is downtown Woodstock, Woodstock and we started working on this in the early 2000s. And there really was just a little bit of a historic downtown and, and that goes to the railroad track. And it was really mostly wooded with a little bit of development. And this is the master plan uh, that was developed and you can see 575 here to the left and then their downtown area today. And this is a zoomed in version of this plan. And this to the right here was phase one. 
and then this is phase two that came later. Um, some of the pieces of the puzzle that you'll you'll see here, um, and on the top on the top left, you see the street network how it was in 2000. There was very little connectivity, um, all these dead end streets, and today if you go there, you'll see all this gridded street network. And which is very important because as, as your city becomes more and more successful, traffic increases and this really helps disperse traffic. The other big thing that I think is important to think about is, is green space. In 2000, there was one park in this area. And today, if you look at in 2010, you can see all the different green spaces, which is I think another important part of making a place more livable, you know, decreasing traffic and creating great parks make places um, more livable. Um, this is a example of it's the largest building in downtown Woodstock. At the time it was built, it was um, it was very large for that community. Most buildings were one story, two story max. And so you can see the street facing ground floor retail and it actually has condominiums above. It's very traditional in nature. And I'll show you another building that's built beside it that is opposite of that, it's a little bit more modern. Another important thing is these are townhouses. Um, so when you're building a little bit more dense product, it is very important to have this, this passive green space for people to, to go and walk their dogs and to hang out uh, with more density. I mentioned the, the more modern building. Uh, this is right beside a traditional building. It's a mixed use building. But it's interesting to think about how you can have some more modern buildings in a, in a more traditional downtown surrounded by traditional architecture and it, and it can work. This is a great example of it. I, I wasn't sure at the time when, when I saw this, I was like, wow, what, how is this going to look? But I think it turned out and it, really nice. Again, this is um, for spaces for people to congregate in. Um, people are waiting here to go into the Mexican restaurant or go into other restaurants. Um, and when they're really busy and they can just hang out here if you're waiting on someone while they're finish, finishing up shopping. It's just great spaces, um, heavily landscaped with seating. Um, it's very important during the hot summer months to have these shade trees. Another project we worked on last couple of years is Parsons Alley in, in, in Duluth, Georgia. This is the, we did a downtown master plan originally and this is, this is it. I've highlighted Parsons Alley and we'll go more into detail of that. There's also single family houses and townhouses here that are um, under construction or, or completed. Um, we planned out a spot for a new library and then additional retail in this, this long area and then some streetscape projects in these areas to improve, um, to in increase parking and also improve walkability. And then all of this was thought about and we create a stormwater park. Um, to deal with the stormwater as some of this was being um, built out in one location. So this is the Parsons Alley project. It's a historic, a lot of historic buildings on this site. So and it's in the right in the historic downtown. Um, you can see the main street streetscape. I'll show you an image of that. We also did a phase two streetscape where we added more parking up here in front of this um, school. And we also have parking in this area and then around around this block. Um, there's a plaza in the center here and then here is some some of the buildings that surround it and I'll sh show you an, an image of what it looks like today. Um, this is a old city hall, old church actually originally and then here's the parsonage house and they're both restaurants now. This is that plaza area. This is historically an old bank. Um, now it's a bakery and then these buildings really mimic the placement um, the, of the original buildings. We really wanted to save the original buildings, but when we got into it, that there was structural issues. And there was actually a building here where the um, plaza is, so that was demolished. And the parking also um, was located here and we kind of re reworked it some. And here's this alley here that you see in this part is the historic Parsons Alley where the name comes from. Um, the Parsons family owned this block. It was a furniture store. So we're paying kind of homage to the hist history there. And we also kept this block intact in a lot of different ways. 
This is an example of streetscape project where we widened the upper sidewalk, um, added street trees, came in with uh, mid-block crossings to get people safely across the, the streets and added um, a lot of the landscaping's all new, really trying to make it um, a great place to be. I mentioned that alley. This is a shot of that alley looking the other way from the parking lot to, to the plaza. Um, it's also important to have gateway signage and think about your branding uh, of your downtowns and, and your projects. And this is an example of some branding that we worked on with and really taking Parsons Alley and letting everyone know. Um, and so now people think about this area as kind of the Parsons Alley. And then at night, you know, if you're trying to draw people at night, it's important to think about lighting. Um, this is um, simple lighting is a lot of people are doing this now with the string lights, but up, up lights and just thinking about having enough lighting where people feel safe. And it can also be really cool. You can do LEDs and change in different colors. And so there's a lot of different opportunities with, with lighting. This central plaza is really a gathering place to bring everyone together. Um, they have an open container there. Um, and so it really, all the restaurants you can spill out into this area. And this is really a restaurant centric deal. Um, there's numerous restaurants in this area. And so it really has a great um, nightlife when people are waiting to go eat or they're just hanging out and it's a programmed space. It shows you examples of a festival they're having um, where, where they have art, artists set up. And the other important piece that we like to include in all, all our projects is really public art. I really like to get local public art if possible. This is, and you can see there, there's a great image here. And this is actually kinetic, it moves. So it's a really cool piece of, piece of art. Another project that's um, dear to Stephanie, Stephanie actually worked, worked with us on this in the beginning helped and helped spearhead this. This is um, Powder Springs Town Center. And we've been hearing over the years through the planning process from the, from the neighborhood that they really, and from the city, that they really want to make downtown more vibrant. And so we were working with them to come up with a way to make their downtown more vibrant, really look at it from an economic development standpoint. How do we bring people to those existing businesses and new businesses? So the idea really was to create this, this park in, in downtown. A lot of these buildings here to the south are existing historic buildings all around it. And so this is really centralized. And this is what it looks like today. And so we didn't want to do just a green space, though sometimes that's great, but we wanted to have an amphitheater because we wanted to bring people downtown. It's, it's going to be highly programmed. Um, they're going to have seafood festivals, concerts, and be able to bring people downtown. That then those people will, you know, then go to the businesses, the local businesses. So we think it's a win-win for the community, and we're starting to see a lot of um, development around this area, more townhouses, people starting to invest into the existing buildings. This is another shot of the amphitheater. It has a green room in the back and then it has um, bathrooms and, as part of this building. And the park is a 365 days a year park. So you can come out, uh, out here. This is a piece of playable art where we're trying to create that art, but it also kids can come around it on top of the cube. It also has a splash pad, so during the summer, the kids can come out, or adults can come out and, and jump in the splash pad, and then also it can be turned off if they're having a, a large concert. So it's very programmable. And you, know, you can see in the foreground a ping, ping pong table, really trying to come up with activities for, for all demographics. Um, in, in the background here, you see seats here, so you can come out and hang out and work on your laptop and get some work done. I mentioned some of the adaptive reuse. This is um, one of the oldest wood structures in Georgia, and it's an old general store. And now it was renovated to become back the Rooted Trading Company. So it, it actually acts like an old trading company now. And, uh, and so it's, it's a great, it uh, shows a great adaptive reuse. And there's more adaptive reuse going on. There's a coffee and ice cream shop coming in. So we're really starting to see that, some new restaurants. We're excited about seeing that economic development happening. This is a, um, a little different project. It's a streetscape project in Midtown Atlanta. 
Um, Midtown was looking at trying to do a quick project to get some bike facilities on Spring Street. And if you see, they this is a design of the the bike facilities. This is a one-way cycle track, so it's buffered. Um, but what happened was all this parallel parking is left over and you can't use it anymore because it's blocked off. And so the, it was a problem. So that we wanted to come up with a way to use that space. And some of the answers that we came up with, and this is really fresh. It's only like last couple of months that we've been working on this and it's still in the concept phase. Um, this is a wood deck with seating, um, uh, with bar seating. This area actually has um, cornhole, concrete cornhole with some um, seating area as a place for public park. And this area here has tables and chairs set up. There's a, there's a restaurant close by. And then here is um, bike parking with some um, art on the asphalt. And here's a 3D image of this. You can see how, how it would work. We're trying to create nice buffers, uh, making it um, really turning a dead space into a place that's more livable and, um, and it separates the bicycle and scooter lane and then taking that parallel parking and actually using it for, for people and pedestrians instead of cars. And here's an example of the art painted bicycle, bicycle parking. Really want to let people notice where the bicycle parking is. So this is, since this is a cycle track, this is an example of the outdoor seating area, how it would look. So that's all I have. Appreciate the opportunity to um, to give you some well, some ideas that in some of our projects that we're working on currently. Thank you. All right, thanks, Adam. Uh, we'll hear, hear from uh, April Norton next. And as April's getting set up with her screen share, just want to remind everybody if there's any questions about any of the uh, projects Adam was talking to or any just general questions, uh, he's the private sector guy. So if you've got questions that uh, you'd like to, to get some answers from him, go ahead and feel free to type those in the, the Q&A and we'll get to those at the end. But April, go ahead. Okay. Can you see my presentation? Yep, you're up, looks good. Okay. Well, first of all, um, thank you for the opportunity to be able to love on uh, Thomasville a little bit today and um, <clears throat> share about placemaking here in Thomasville and the impact that we've been able to make over the last few years with a few projects. So um, I'll lead on into the presentation. Um, <clears throat> we all know that um, placemaking efforts um, really, really capitalize its impact in creating public spaces um, that promotes people's health and wellness and, um, and their happiness. And I was in a, a DCA conference a few years ago about bikeability, and one of the comments there just really stuck with me in that, um, have you ever seen anyone riding a bike that wasn't smiling? And so I really thought about that as um, our community has moved forward with placemaking. And so um, you see on the screen placemaking with our creative district vision plan. Um, back in 2014, we put together um, an opportunity for our public, art, public arts division, which is our Thomasville Center for the Arts, and the city and then connected our community we had more than 120 community members come out and be a part of a creative district vision plan and what we got from that um, which was a several day process was that we wanted our community and we wanted the creative district of our downtown to feel more walkable and connected um, more bikeable bike friendly um, a business and entrepreneurial friendly environment. We wanted to activate the space um, through several ways, and we'll talk about that as well. Um, just as Adam just presented, art being a big part of that. This part of our downtown is considered our creative district where our makers and artisans really kind of draw into. Um, but we also wanted to make sure that we were, of course, um, preserving the historic and creative themed identity of the area um, 
through that, we were able to make it, uh, beautify that, make it more attractive, uh, improve parking, which um, is something that's always spoken of needing improving in downtown communities, um, traffic safety, improving our sidewalks, the character, and we thought lastly, you know, we will fill our empty storefronts. And um, what we found was just the reverse of that. The impact of involving our community in this process from day one allowed people to invest themselves into our community, into um, the projects, and really have a buy-in that filled those empty storefronts even before the completion of any of the projects under our creative district vision plan. So um, I'll move on to our next slide here. Connecting our community. Um, the creative district vision plan, um, it is our creative district, but there's a portion of that that has been known as the bottom, which is a very historic part of our downtown. And um, through this project, you'll see in a video later in the presentation, um, we did three different things. We developed a community trailhead, which is a 15 mile community trail. Uh, we, did, we built the Ritz Amphitheater and Park, and then also did a West Jackson streetscape project. And the purpose of this was to not only connect this area of our downtown, to the rest of our downtown streets, but to our neighborhoods, um, our neighboring community there, our schools. Um, we were able to do that through this project. So this is our creative district plan. This is the area that uh, we are looking at. It is just a portion of our downtown, um, but we wanted to really embrace that partnership of the creative arts through that retail business space. So this is our um, multi-use trail. It is a 15 mile walking and biking trail that um, it, it's not yet complete, but the portions in our downtown district are. Um, <clears throat> this project is, has been able to be developed through our SPLOS funding. The Ritz Amphitheater is also a piece to this project. Uh, this was the very first event that we were able to hold in this space. And um, I will tell you all that um, we really put feet on the ground here. If you notice in the top corner here, this grassy lot there was where we started our first Friday concerts. And we said, if we can draw people to this space, then we know that we can, that our community needs this and, and we can grow from there. And so we really, literally put feet on the ground, boots to the ground to see if this was gonna work. And um, so you'll see more about that as well. And then the West Jackson Streetscape Project, which we were able to finish uh, the end of last year. And um, this shows you kind of the before and then the vision for that. And then you'll see the after through a video that I have. Um, I wanted to show a few projects of restoration these projects were complete prior to um, the completion of the amphitheater and prior to the West Jackson streetscape. So the business owners and property owners invested into these spaces, purchased the property because they were involved in the process and redeveloped it um, even before any of the other was constructed. And so that I feel like is really the importance of involving your community and your stakeholders in the process of planning. Uh, this project is award winning. Um, we have been able to receive through our local landmarks division awards for restoration of the downtown bricks in the area and the creative district vision plan with the build of the amphitheater and West Jackson streetscape. Um, but I feel like the most awarding piece of it is just the activation of the streets and so that's why I have a picture of um, the first Victorian Christmas event that we were able to hold on our streetscape there. Um, so I'll go into that. Here's our video and we'll go ahead and get started. What is creativity? Is it what we make or the people who make it? Is it a place or just a place in our minds? 
the people of Thomasville wanted to find out, how do you design a community that encourages and nurtures creativity? In March 2014, City of Thomasville leadership and staff hosted a three-day intensive workshop to discuss the formation of a new creative district. More than 120 community leaders and citizens participated in a design charrette. Through a community design planning session, a master plan for the new creative district was produced using an incremental approach. A multi-year plan was developed targeted at increasing economic opportunity, revitalizing the historic area, and bringing creative community resources together in this historic segment of downtown Thomasville. Through our inclusive approach, the goals for the project were identified as the development of a walkable and connected community, developing a business and entrepreneurial friendly environment, activating spaces, and preserving the historic and creative themed identity of the district. It's just part of the history that we grew up under, now it's being revitalized. Uh, the city of Thomasville is working with the community. It has been our best in all the way long. And, I, and I'm coming back, being able to help make this city move forward to the future. There were three major components of this plan. A community trailhead, an amphitheater and park, and a streetscape project. One key component of the plan was extending the community trail system to connect downtown to other neighborhoods and parks in Thomasville. This goal was accomplished with the completion of the official trailhead, which includes restroom facilities and space for public art. The trailhead is located in the heart of what is known as the Bottom District, a historically significant section of downtown that has seen the transition from industry to minority-owned businesses to today's retail stores, restaurants, and creative ventures. Another important aspect of the plan was the construction of a municipal amphitheater that also serves as a public park. Both the community trailhead and Ritz Amphitheater and Park were completed in 2017 and now host hundreds of events each year, including the popular First Friday Sip and Stool concert series. The final project in the multi-year plan, the West Jackson Streetscape Project, was completed in November of 2019. The design of the streetscape was truly a community effort, using a combination of surveys, roundtable discussions, stakeholder and business owner workshops, discovery walks, and public presentations that included more than 200 participants. For years, West Jackson Street had seen a slow decline in business activity. The revitalization of the creative district, historically known as the bottom, hasn't just brought new vitality to the area, it has been an economic boom. Since 2014, there have been more than $8 million in both public and private investment in the area, a net gain of 30 new businesses and over 160 new job opportunities. Part of the reason I wanted to be in a downtown area was to get people who'd never thought about doing this craft walking in, and by the time they had walked around the store, going, oh, maybe I want to do that. So we got much more of that once other businesses came, once the amphitheater was finished, and then of course with the sidewalks, it really helped that out. So now that the project is finished, um, we have more people walking through, and the foot traffic has picked up, and they will stop in and try to get their hands we saw all the renovations that were that started and we saw the resources that were being put behind this project. And so this building came open and we signed a lease. Transforming the bottom into a creative district has made a lasting impact on our community that we can all take pride in and at the same time helps us honor and preserve the area's rich history for generations to come. This project has become a model for how innovation can be achieved using public input as a driving force behind design and promises to be the framework for how the city of Thomasville approaches future community projects. What is creativity? It's what we make. It's how we make it together. So to close with that, um, the, we our numbers have actually increased since um, this video was put in place. Um, the investment was eight million when we did that. Now it is at um, over ten point five million dollars in investment. And um, one of the things that I like to say to that is that. 5.5 of that was an investment by the city, so that is um, public investment, but it was nearly matched with 5 million in private investment. So that just shows you that when your community invests into those spaces and um, that the private sector will follow. And we have proposed five other new businesses that will open in the creative district um, over this next year, which will bring in at least 40 new job opportunities as well.
Uh, we've been able to partner with our Center for the Arts for several projects since this development, and we currently have 25 murals um, that are placed, and they're temporary murals placed throughout our creative district by five different artists um, with our Wildlife Arts Festival. So drawing in, activating the space, using um, creative art, and making it an entrepreneurial friendly environment is certainly what we've been able to do through this place making initiative. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. April, thank you so much. Uh, and if you do have any questions, go ahead and start typing those into the, the Q&A uh, box there. We will definitely uh, address those at the end. But we've got one more presentation and that is Ms. Courtney Harcourt. Uh, Courtney, go ahead and uh, take over the screen and, uh, and show us what's going on in Newman. Hey everyone, if you guys will bear with me, I'm going to share my screen really quick. Um, we are going to look at a project that really spearheaded placemaking in downtown Noonan. Um, and I would say, I would venture to say citywide. Um, we're coming to a close with some of our projects in this area, so we have a good idea what the overall impact has been. Um, but it's, it's really just a great example of, uh, of really getting your foot in the door with placemaking. Um, so, in 2017, if you were to ask, um, we probably would not have known much about the word placemaking throughout the community. Um, our staff and our team would have heard it and, you know, we were interested in looking into placemaking, but, um, but it wasn't a known idea or practice. Um, and overall, we, in Newton, we really have been making place for a long time. I think that in most communities, you guys would probably venture to say that you um, have been actively working to create place um, since places existed. Um, and I thought I'd just Courtney, just real quick, you're uh, you haven't done a, any screen share yet, so we're we're not uh, not seeing something. If you were trying to trying to show something on your screen, all right. Let's see. The good news is that I've only gone through one slide. <laughs> Caught it early. <laughs> yep. Can you see my screen at all now? No, we're still it's still showing the the windows of, of the speakers. All right. And what about now? Nope, same thing. Interesting. I apologize for the attendees. We had a little bit of an issue when we were testing things out earlier. Um, there you go. Okay. Sharing your Up and going. Um, so I'll just do a really quick review. Uh, we started off speaking about investing in place. This is the beginning slide. And then these were the examples I was beginning to describe. Um, uh, if you look to the far left, this is a great example from the late 80s of placemaking in Noonan before it had a purpose. Um, we actually have photos of this wonderful competition to where this young man um, had a chainsaw on the square and he was one of many that created um, an ice rendering of our courthouse. Um, if you look to the top right, um, this mural was a community art project um, in partnership with our artist in residence program. The artist is out of Atlanta um, and she kind of drew the swimsicle design that um, it's actually on several buildings within the greater Atlanta metro area, similar designs, but the difference between this and her other projects is she actually kind of did a paint by number with the community. Um, and this project was put into place without a relationship with our Main Street program um, to drive the community. It was just the artist and residence program itself. Um, and then below you'll see um, this fiberglass figurine of a horse. We had several series of these figurines um, appear on the square every two years for about six years as a fundraiser, fundraiser for our children's museum. Um, again, this is placemaking, um, but it didn't really have a long-standing purpose or direction. It was just a rotation of these great horses that 
after a certain amount of time, they somewhat disappeared really and you, um, and you rotated them out. So in 2017, we stumbled upon our first placemaking project with purpose. Um, and it was more of a problem solver. Um, we were implementing a downtown sanitation program for the first time. Um, we had gone um, from around a 20% vacancy rate within the central business district to less than a 5% vacancy rate. And um, several anchor restaurants or businesses in Noonan are restaurants around this area. And they had created this nice little wasteland, um, which was sort of in limbo for everyone because our alleys are not completely publicly owned. So our private contractor could not technically go back and clean this mess up, nor remove construction material, and the city really couldn't trespass in this area either. Um, so we thought, you know, maybe as we're rolling out the sanitation program, um, we can provide some amenities and um, in place to the project. It was really difficult. Um, as you can see, there are several property owners um, listed in, um, and typed out. And then um, I liked to use this because this was the actual piece of paper that we first put together with post-it notes on it to figure out who owned the alley, um, what businesses were in, you know, these buildings. Um, and then we had to figure out what easements existed. Um, and there are a lot of utilities, um, you know, in these areas. There's sewer, there's water, there's power, there's um, different telecommunications, some of them that, you know, aren't in use, some that were, but we found that in these wasteland scenarios, um, it's common for uh, wires to be above ground and in order that's dangerous and hazardous. Um, and then we had to think about, you know, really, how are we going to pay for this? This isn't a part of our sanitation program, um, and we really hadn't budgeted for it, but after we kind of dug in, we, we saw a lot of potential to do something great back here. So if you look um, towards the north sector of the screen on the map, there's an L-shaped corridor, and that's the entrance to Wadsworth Alley. And then it kind of steps into a courtyard um, that we call the backyard. It's actually privately owned. So that'll be important when you're looking through the photos to kind of get a sense of direction. Um, but um, essentially, we sat down and met with every single person listed here um, in handwriting or in font, and we found no opposition to, um, to our program going back and sort of looking at the area. Our first step was to clean it up. Um, waste management, our prior con trash pro or service provider, um, they actually were happy to help. Um, I, I don't think that there was a big issue with the city taking on some of this work. It was um, in an area that was hard for them. We removed so much waste. If you look at the top right corner, that is a component of an HVAC that I would like to just go ahead and call historic because it's at least 50 years old. Um, and then if you if you look in the middle, that's actually the owner of what we call the backyard. Um, and you can see that he had been left with a lot of debris and construction material over the years that did not belong to him. And if you look behind um, the owner, you can you can see the really terrible stains on the walls and um, near his feet, there's some erosion that we'll get to that here in a couple of slides. But um, we learned, you know, through this that, that we had a really bad drainage problem um, and it was hard to grow sod in these areas or make paths with that issue. So we had to get creative there as well. So here's some before and after. To the left is the before, to the right is the after. This was taken um, this summer before we cleaned it up. Uh, left is before, um, right is after. You can see we cut things back and we put um, a little bit of mulch down and, and clean things up a bit. And then here's the last slide before and after. This is March. This is sort of us coming in in 2017 and just getting a group of volunteers together to, um, to just see what we had back there. We couldn't really tell where we would be able to go until we cleaned it up. But the building um, that you see um, and the, the northern part of the photo um, was essentially a shrub. Uh, we, we got permission to cut that back and to kill that shrub because we weren't sure what was behind the shrub. The building had been vacant for 12 years at this point. Um, and it's quite a large building. It's um, 8,000 square feet, 4,000 downstairs. 
um, 4,000 upstairs. So uh, we rallied some of our businesses together and created um, a couple of small temporary projects to sort of, you know, give the space some life, if you will. Um, we had a member of the community donate um, several series of magazines to our partner, Cute and Beautiful. And uh, we cut those magazines up and made this um, chain link uh, system to sort of decorate the entrance to the alley. Um, and we actually hosted a small concert in the alley um, as is just, you know, just clean with the chain links. And we, we use them to block off utilities as well. If you see in the right, you'll find some of those chain links to keep people out of areas they shouldn't be in. Um, some other small projects that were low budget, we had a business donate, um, uh, I believe these are pickle buckets, and we spray painted them. Um, we used some um, planters that were donated by Habitat for Humanity, uh, or cabinets, excuse me, filing cabinets, and we retrofitted them into planters, had a little community garden there. Myself and my coworker actually seeded most of these plants in our office with donated seeds. Um, so we took things to the next level um, after finding success with these small projects. Um, and we turned to one of our partners, this is Will, um, with the Georgia Realtor Association. Will had contacted us years prior to talk about better block projects. And at the time we didn't have, um, we didn't have anything in our wheelhouse to really move in that direction. However, after finding success in the event that we hosted in the alley and hearing the community buzz about it, um, we thought that we might have something to bite on there. Um, so we, you know, thought about what we needed to bring to the table, some seed money. We needed to put a little bit of money into the project rather than relying on donations of material. Um, resources, um, we had several people reach out to us uh, and, and mention they'd love to provide some in-kind donations, art, materials, supplies, things of that matter. Um, Volunteers, we already had a group of volunteers that were beginning to be bored by working, you know, special events and um, and they, they turned out and enjoyed becoming repeat um, commitments to our uh, many work days. Our partnerships, our partners love this idea and the placemaking and the brewing, if you will, and staff dedication. Our team had fun and they liked participating in our work days and so we had a lot of support from City Hall as well. Um, and then we realized how important publicity was going to be. Um, it was around this time, summer of 2017, so we're a couple months into it, that we're starting to use the word placemaking. And uh, we're starting to see the community respond to that word and, and want to know more about it. And so we had to really engage and make sure that if we're going to take on projects using this word that the community's invited to, that, that we really reached out and tried to get in front of um, different groups. Um, so the uh, Georgia Association of Realtors through the local board of Realtors applied um, to a grant through the National Association of Realtors. And this was our first um, little bit of funding towards Wadsworth Alley. It was $2,800 and we bought art in place um, essentially, which was seating and a couple of other things to make it more of an inviting community space. And as you can see, they helped us build furniture and spread mulch um, and move things around. Um, and at that point, that's when we really started our public engagement activities. We built a chalkboard in the alley um, as a short-term piece of, of art, if you will, to allow people to share what they'd like this, how they'd like to see the space programmed. Um, we hosted public meetings to introduce placemaking to the community. And we also hosted public meetings to see how the community would like that the space to sort of evolve. Um, we did that simultaneously so that um, we kind of separated the two into a you know practice versus a project. Um, and we also looked back on the existing resources. After being in the alley for a couple of months, we realized that we had plans that were existing that we hadn't reviewed that might shed some light on some things that we could do. Um, we actually found a plan that showcased the potential for different alleys as program, just different things. Um, and then we looked back at a, a team visit and a report that was uh, provided by the, um, the Georgia Department of Economic Development's Tourism Product Development Team. It's such a mouthful. Um, 
They visited in 2017, delivered the report in 2018, um, and alleyway projects were not mentioned. However, placemaking projects were recognized throughout some of our suggestions in the report. And we thought that it might be a great opportunity to apply for one of their grant programs that year. Um, so it was more or less determining that Wadsworth Alley could also be a tourism product. Um, and that led to our award of the um, tourism product development grant. Um, and with that, we really took it up a notch. Uh, we created the destination impact to the alley. And that included um, programs, hosting programs out in the alley and, and really promoting it as a place to host programs. We had someone recently contact us because they wanted to have their wedding in the alley. Um, we placed seating out um, two years later, it's still there. Um, additional seating, the bistro seating. And um, the alley now has sod, more shrubs, art, um, and a stage. Um, we got creative with some of the games in the upcycled stop signs. Um, if you guys notice to the far right, most cities have just a pile of, of stop signs or uh, red work signs that are, you know, beyond use. They're dented, they have graffiti all over them. Um, and we found they're great for making art and games. Um, we had a sign shop actually um, donate the wrapped um, repurposed signs and our local newspaper um, sent these wonderful photos that we've um, placed on them. And the, the great thing about these photos is a lot of them are from the 80s, which is a time in, you know, the near recent past that um, really doesn't get a lot of attention in downtowns because a lot of us were going through um, sort of urban decay at that time. Um, and then if you, if you look to the left, you can see some of the donated art projects. They're kind of fun and whimsical and um, a little urban, but it, it's suitable for this place. Here's some, um, some more images of the alley. If you'll notice um, the bottom photo and the photo to the right, we resolved a lot of those drainage issues by rerouting um, the roof, uh, the, 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 uh, the issues they were having with the roofs and the runoff into rain barrels. So that also provided a water source for the alley. And then in the top, you'll see one of these figurines, the fiberglass figurines we, we spoke about in the beginning. Um, as a permanent piece in the alley. So overall, um, we want to look at impact. From 2010 to 2018, um, if you look at property sales, there were 14 transactions, and um, that totaled, those 14 transactions for those, that time span totaled a little less than what we saw happen in four years from 2018 to 2020. Um, from 2010 to 2017, a lot of property sales that abutted the alley, um, we're calling this the Wadsworth block. Um, they were, you know, a dollar each to a new LLC that someone had created. And from 2018 to 2020, you saw, saw actual buildings that had been vacant, one for 12 years, one for three years, um, and, and one that a business had grown out of um, to change hands. And, um, and that was great because it, it was far more of an impact. Uh, the resources reviewed, in-kind donations, uh, the placemaking micro grant, the TPD grant from the Georgia Department of Economic Development, matching funds from the DDA. We have issued two uh, facade grants through Main Street Noonan, um, revolving loan funds through uh, uh, DCA, uh, Georgia Cities Foundation revolving loan funds. This is one project, the building that was vacant for 12 years. Uh, they also considered historic preservation tax credits, but it didn't suit the needs of the project. The project was scaled a little bit smaller um, than what they wanted to really to consider with that. Um, the Wadsworth block is within the Central Business District. Uh, that's our historic commercial core, and it's a National Register Historic District. Uh, so resources reviewed. You can see that the total um, that we put into the alley was less than $15,000. Um, that doesn't include some of the in-kind donations, such as the stop signs. That probably cost, you know, retail, would retail around $1,000 from, from what the sign company has told us. But it does, uh, these are real dollars spent on the alley. And then if you look at the overall impact between the building improvements um, and property sales, um, it's over $1.3 million worth of investment that we've seen 
in just a couple of years. And most of those projects are coming to an end currently. There's one commercial space that's not leased. Um, there, the building that had been vacant for 12 years um, on Madison Street, um, it now has four loft apartments and two commercial spaces. Downstairs, one of those commercial spaces has back alley access. So this really created a ripple in Noonan that we've seen um, over the past couple of years really spread. Um, our, the press releases that we submitted and the public meetings that we hosted attracted the attention of Team Better Block. Um, they're out of uh, Dallas, Texas, and they approached us out of the blue and asked if we'd be interested in working with them. Um, through that, uh, we worked with the National um, Association of Realtors again for a Smart Growth Grant. And this led to our placemaking master plan, which we've been implementing for the past several years. Um, that also, that connection led us to learn more about a, a grant program through AARP. Um, we applied for that grant and actually have extended our alleyway projects. So um, we're hoping to complete projects in most of our alleyways that have public access. Um, and these are photos of, um, of this alley that we will be working on this year. Um, it's gonna be more of a corridor and we have short term, medium term and long term plans to activate the alley. We have already started on short term. And so further than that, and this would be a presentation within its own, had we have not had that place making master plan coming into 2020, we wouldn't have been able to pull things off that we've pulled off this year. Very early on, as early as May, we had parklets popping up, um, as well as pop-ups. Um, we have an open container district, um, several other things that really the, the, the play and the placemaking really came into play, if you will, um, during uh, the stay at home order. And we revised plans that we already had on the books to sort of meet the needs of um, spreading out and um, using our space and our place differently. So that's it. Thank you guys for listening. It's just a, a small project that has had a long impact in Noonan. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to, um, to ask them now, or you can take my information and email me or call me. All right, Courtney, thanks. And actually, our first question is very specifically for you. Um, Andrew Simpson wanted to know, did the, uh, did the alley remain in private ownership? It looks like there was some projects done on it. So how, how did the, what's the ownership status of that? It hasn't changed at all. Okay, so, it's so still everyone um, really has a share of the, the alley. Um, if you go to the entrance um, and to the part that abuts the building that was vacant for several years because of easements, and then the actual courtyard itself, the green space that you saw in the photos, that belongs to one person who is very generous and shares the alley. Well, good. All right, uh, anybody that's got any questions for any of our presenters and panelists, uh, go ahead and put those in the, uh, the Q&A now. Um, I'm gonna ask a question actually of everybody. This might be a little more focused on April and Courtney, uh, but Adam would, would love some feedback for you. And it's really about the community engagement aspect. So Courtney, you were talking of your example about the, uh, the chalkboard of the alley, really trying to get some people in there. And you mentioned some other parts too. April, you did a whole, whole video about the community engagement aspect. So I, I guess I just wanna get some general comments. So I'll ask a few questions and then you can kinda go. And, and April, we'll start from you. In that video, it referenced the three days and 120 people that were engaged. How much planning went into that and how much did you have to kinda push to, to be able to say that at the end? And, and really, you wanted to get key leaders, I could tell from, from that. So how many of, uh, um, I guess, events or sessions of those three days were you invited everybody from the public? Because uh, here's, here's mine, I'm, I'm in Osceola, we're trying to get community engagement. It's real easy to get the people that say what they don't want, um, but, but not always easy to get that, that positive input. And, that, and it sounds like you guys have achieved that, maybe because there's already been projects and community engagement that you've got, gotten to build some inertia off of. But just talk about that specific to, to your, your video project, April, and then Courtney, I want to hear from you on some of the other things you did and, and how you got people involved. April, go ahead. Okay. Um, first of all, the 120 people that gathered over that, um, those few days was just the start of it. Um, but I will say through the, the West Jackson Streetscape project, really that was when we, we really 
set the way and pave the way of how we will move forward with projects in the city of Thomasville. Um, we, we had nearly 20 um, open events for people to come and share their views on what they wanted to see. We literally walked in with a blank sheet of paper and said, what do you want to see here? And I think we were really able to build trust during that time. And um, as I said, it's really set the way of how we move forward because as we know, um, the incremental approach is really the way that we have to go in that. Um, we know that these projects aren't gonna develop overnight, but by developing a vision with community involvement, um, then the work to meet the goals to complete that vision really just falls into place. So um, we actually did discovery walks um, what that is, is just saying, hey, during this day, at this time, we would have a morning session and an afternoon session. We're going to meet you on West Jackson Street and come and walk the streets with us. And that was really how we had our merchants who, you know, their storefronts face those, those sidewalks come up and be a part of it because they said, no, we don't need, you know, water sidewalks or no, we don't need any, um, curb you know curbside pedestrian walk space there or um mid-block crossing but when we actually went out there and they got to see like with a tape measure and with a speed tracker to be able to see it firsthand and we used an a-frame as considered like a vehicle or a person and we saw where people would slow down when you kind of brought that space in for that mid-block crossing versus leaving it out. And so it did begin to slow down traffic and open up eyes. So just that incremental approach there um, for that place making, preserving it and restoring it with those historic buildings certainly has been um, an ending cap to that as well. Courtney, go ahead and talk about some of the other things. And I, I did want to, uh, I, I really like, you're so, you know, you have a degree in this. You're histo historic preservation minded. So to label an HVAC as a historic property, I, I appreciated that. <laughs> it, it had to have been at least 50 years old. Um, so community engagement, um, you, I really think we stumbled upon the community engagement component to placemaking. Um, the first set of volunteers that, showed up was more than double what we expected. And then the photo of those volunteers caused other volunteers to start buzzing about it. And I'd mentioned in my, um, in my presentation, um, we weren't using the word placemaking yet. We weren't introducing that word to the community. And I think that we sort of led by example with this project first. Um, and we discovered placemaking as a community sort of together. And that bridged relationships. Um, you know, the first several months that we were in the alley, the donations that we received through so many partners that I haven't mentioned um, were immense and they were generous. And figuring out how to seed plants in our office with a plant lamp, um, these things just kept happening and we kept getting pushed. And it wasn't big things. I mean, it wasn't when we were seeding those plants, we didn't expect to see over $1.3 million reinvested into this alley, I mean, into this area. We didn't really expect for that building that had been vacant for 12 years to become four loft apartments and two commercial storefronts. But the more and more we worked and the more people expressed an interest in participating, we sort of realized that the public input was really what was going to make and shape the deal. Um, and, and so we started hosting those meetings, but we also started started using public input creatively, um, similar to, um, to uh, what April mentioned with hosting the walks. We also hosted walks. We've hosted numerous placemaking walks. We've brought in consultants to walk with people to where, as staff, we, we don't say anything. We just listen. And sometimes we aren't even there. Um, or, um, you know, we, we've partnered with different organizations to just give a, a, an overview of placemaking. That includes a lot of um, not necessarily being a keynote speaker, but being the opening speaker to, you know, our Kiwanis big luncheon for the year, things of that nature. Um, we sort of have had to get in front of audiences where we can um, and engage them. And then, and then we see that input brought back into our projects, such as the Wadsworth Alley project and the new Carnegie Thompson project. Um, people just seem to get excited. And, and we also have a great relationship with 
um, with our newspaper. Uh, they have they are actually located across the street from Wadsworth Alley, so they've seen this um, take place and they've they've noted how it's impacted their property. Um, they've sat down and spoken to us about some of our loan programs that we work with and are, are even interested in reactivating the space that they own. So they're a really big cheerleader and that helps a lot. Um, but overall, I think placemaking is so unique in that it's not political for the most part. I mean, we, we've had people argue um, over how um, street art to some of our placemaking projects are. They'd like to see more formal um, ideas uh, and, and that's about as political as it gets. And anyone who attends a meeting can choose to get involved in something that they see instant gratification with versus counting tickets at one of our events. You know that that gives back to the community, but you don't see it and you don't get to kind of roll your sleeves up and, 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 and really, you know, see it happening. And then the economic impact, um, the building that was vacant when we started working in the alley, um, along with some help from code enforcement, the property owner almost immediately listed the building. I mean, it had been sitting there for so many years and he, I think he purchased it in 2010, um, mostly vacant then. And, um, and it was just interesting. He just saw us clean it up and put up some paper chain links. Yeah, that's all we did. There's, there's, it's only a spotlight that we put on in, in this area and it's still, you know, it's difficult to maintain. We have to constantly consider sanitation and drainage and, resodding and you know AT&T needing some access and digging half the alley up it gets dug up at least once or twice a year but the commitment that volunteers have to the alley and the um the continued press that we get and, and how it's used those small things really bring people in and, and make them want to participate um so yeah Adam, you're going to have a very different perspective. I want to make sure we we gain from you. You have the you're coming in to the communities, and while I know I can learn from what Noonan and, and Thomasville are doing and how they're doing community engagement, I bet you have some examples because I'd love to know if there's something that worked in Nicaragua, uh, how I can. <laughs> uh, so so what what's something maybe you've observed, even if you haven't been quite in the same role as as April and Courtney have on the community engagement side. Well, we use a lot of the same techniques April and Courtney spoke about. Um, I, I do think that getting community involvement is, is critical um, in the beginning. Um, we, you know, we really preach that to try to get community involved. And we use a lot of the techniques that Courtney and April talked about. Um, a lot of times, you know, communities don't have a, they're not used to planning. And I worked in a lot of different communities and the ones that have a culture of planning, whether it's doing your comprehensive plan or you're doing a downtown master plan or a streetscape plan, it, it's a lot easier for everyone involved if they've, if they've done it before. Um, I recently, Powder Springs is a good example of, you know, they've done a lot of planning. They, they, we did their, their um, downtown, downtown plan. We did their comprehensive plan. And all part of that were, were three or four meetings. We would have stakeholder meetings we'd have a group of about 20 people that would guide us we would have um, surveys you know a lot of times we do pop-up events where we would go to the people so maybe we go to the Kroger or the grocery store in that community and we we reach out to the people that don't want to talk to us so we'll we'll chase them down and make them give us feedback but we try to make it fun which we'll, we'll have games um, and so I just think that the walking tour, we've done those and those are fantastic, especially if it's a beautiful day, you really have some great um, participation. So I just think that creating that culture um, in a community is an important element. I just worked in one that hasn't done much planning in 20 years and it's a whole lot tougher there than it would have been if they had a community that um, had done some planning um, recently in the last four or five years. So always easier when you've got the momentum that I'm sure Noonan and Thomas will both have uh, as right. far as, you know, because what, what, if it's your third project in five years, obviously you've already worked through some of those things and people are kind of used to the process. Right. Right. Um, I'll, last call, I guess, for any questions from anybody uh, watching the webinar, but I've got one more and, and I'll just go in reverse order. And, and Adam, this is actually a little more directed at you, but I'm sure there's some examples that, that April and Courtney may have. In projects like this, and you actually in your presentation mentioned, well, 
when you when you develop some things, you got you kind of create maybe traffic problems. Maybe there's stormwater problems when you when you do something. What are some of the I guess most common? Um, there's the law of unintended consequences. You're focused on what you're trying to develop and make better, but then there's always going to be some things you have to, you create other problems that you'll, you'll then solve. Uh, and, and Courtney, you, you even mentioned yours, part of your project ended up being a, I'm trying to solve a problem and then it kind of grew from there. So it, it can turn out to be a very good thing. What are some of the things you've seen in your different project experiences where, yeah, we're focused on this, but keep these things in mind because they're, they're going to be issues as you, as you grow or develop. Sure, yeah, I think that most towns we go to, um, everybody thinks they have a traffic problem because they can't park their car in front of the one store they wanna to go to. And we always do these, you know, we go in and we, we start studying it and doing the, counting all their parking spaces. And we're like, well, you really don't have a parking problem, you have a walking problem. And so we can't really typically solve that. So, but you know, when you, when you work in a town, sometimes towns aren't that vibrant and there's not a lot of parking but then over four or five years things start to change and you know if you have an amphitheater like april's talking about or like powder springs um, those drive some traffic um, and they create traffic issues but it's i think it's a win-win because you get people down to these economic development and and working and they go to your stores and things so traffic can be an issue but Traffic also brings that vibrancy and shows that people want to be in those spaces in, in downtowns. Courtney, I'll go to you next. And was there anything either in this project or if there's something, some, some kind of similar issue from a, another project, Noon, and feel free to pull from that, but was there something that maybe you weren't expecting to have to confront in the project that you, you, you had to overcome or deal with along the way? Daily, <laughs> especially <laughs> with all of our placemaking projects, we're in a dense, area um, we're spreading past our nine block um, district currently but up and up to that point um, it's dense and, and every day there was a new problem that arose and we're continuing to see that in um in our new alley that we're working in um and, you know you can't control the property owner the business owner the utility company um and those who may come in and vandalize the alley um, the only thing that we can really control in the spaces that we've been working for alleyway revitalization is sanitation because we do have someone there six days a week to empty trash cans and to pick up debris. Um, I think that it's been important along the way um, to retain an effective line of communication and then to also build relationships. Buy-in's been very important, but to also remember what every person that you've talked to what their concern is for the alley and what their vision is and listening to that to make sure that you're recognizing it even if it's in you know small ways um such as just talking to them and reminding them that you haven't forgotten about something or relocating all of the trash cans to ensure that someone has access even though they were perfectly fine for the public use where they were um i can give you guys a good example it's a small one uh the alley that we have been re working to redevelop um recently was out of another um, problem. We had a church that um, took public right of way and a sidewalk to expand, and we, we didn't have a way to get around it um, to our parks. And so we noticed that the community sort of organically started using this alley to walk through. Um, it's not in the best shape. It had businesses that like to use it as a parking lot. Um, and, and we looked for every opportunity that we had to listen to them and, and wait for the moment to really get in there and start working. Um, we were delayed in construction because of the church's project that abuts the alley. Um, when the stay at home order uh, began, we had several businesses closed. So we now have three new businesses that have finished opening as of this Saturday. Um, and when we started the project, we had one set of, of participants, if you will, with business owners and property owners. And now it's, you know, there's a 75% difference in, in who is back there and how they're using it. So the plans that we had put together are somewhat obsolete. Um, the other day I was walking through and I noticed that the restaurant had brought in, uh, that re recently opened, of whom is wonderful for the downtown. They brought in a very large grease trap, which is hard to hide, um, and have, have executed a new plan for display cleaning supplies. So, you know, and when we went back there to start planning out how we were gonna implement our project, we quickly realized, you know, 
how do we put together a fixture for these mops that looks like someone's head to where maybe the mop hair is the actual art piece? And how do we build something around this, um, this grease trap that's not gonna infuriate the business owner? Or do we paint the grease trap? You know, how do we work around what, we, what we've got? Because if you try to just resolve it by removing it and using force, it never seems to get very far and it can ruin a project. Um, with placemaking because it, it has to give you the warm and fuzzies and that's really the test that we've used in Noonan is if, if it doesn't give you the warm and fuzzies and it's probably not placemaking. So. April, how about uh, some of the things, you in Thomasville, what were some things maybe you ran into and how did you, how did you overcome them? So yes, there, there's always going to be hiccups along the way. I feel like that our partnership of really involving um, our merchants and our community with it has been able to help with that, with the transparency. So seeking involvement there, um, we actually had staff on the streets every single day of the project moving forward so that we were going and talking to each individual merchant and asking them, um, you know, what are some concerns that you have, you know, really being open to that conversation. So that was super helpful because um, even prior to the project, I mean, anytime you do a big project, it's important to update and improve your infrastructure. So one of the things that we did with the West Jackson Streetscape is prior to the project even starting um, in the summer that we did it, the summer before we went and did all underground utility work. So we listened to our merchants and we heard them say, you know, we really can't have this project extend into our fourth quarter. So we really needed to be able to move forward during our summer months. Well, we knew that we couldn't promise that in our timeline of what all we had to do. So by listening to them, we were able to break this project up over two different summers. And the first summer we completed all the underground um, utilities and and that type of thing. And then the next summer worked into what you actually visually see um, and be a part of it. So the underground utility work, the water main, we had several businesses that theirs were popping in from the front of their business and we needed to move that to the back. So while it is an overall approach of um, you know, using your community and that input, I feel like that the personal relationships that you have with your merchants along the streets each day, knowing what their challenges are and what is going to help them, whether it's a handicap access point, you know, into the front versus the rear to be more accessible to the customer. Those types of things really specializes the impact to that specific business. Well, the the time is uh, is up for us. We actually went a little over, so uh, I just really want to thank you, April, Courtney, and Adam. Thank you all for your presentations. Thanks for your your feedback, your input. I hope everyone uh, I got something out of this, so I'm sure everyone else who was attending got something out of it. And I'm gonna hand it back to Stephanie, who's gonna talk about where uh, we can have access to this information even after right now. Stephanie, uh, thank you, Matt, and uh, thank you, panelists. Really appreciate this uh, great information and this great development session. Um, the development sessions are recorded and they will be available on the Georgia Cities Foundation website. That's georgiacitiesfoundation.org. And stay tuned. Uh, we will have these once a month and keep an eye out for them. And in the meantime, everyone enjoy their holidays and have a great afternoon. <laughs>